All right, guys, I'm here with Nick. No, we're at the Trump Doral. Uh, Nick, everyone wants to know what in the world is going on? What are these, what's, what's happening? What's going on? And, and also, who are you? So people would know. Uh, sure. Well, hello, everyone. I, um, I ended up here at the Doral Hotel because I was presenting at the American Priority Conference. Thank you, by the way, American Priority Conference. And uh, the reason I'm here is to tell everyone what really happened in Benghazi. Where I worked was the 603rd AOC out of Ramstein, Germany, and um, we had, we're over AFRICOM and UCOM combined. And uh, in that time, my job was in uh, combat operations and I was in combat reports. I got all of the information from all of our subordinate units and then I made them into situational reports and uh, commander update briefings, also known as a cub briefing. And uh, every morning I would, or every afternoon I would send those out and, uh, and there's a lot of information besides just the subordinate units, there's internal unit information and intelligence, uh, logistics, uh, personnel, uh, weapon status locations of troops all that sort of stuff that all went to my desk so as kind of a unique position everybody I worked with had their own job to do and then they would send that information over whatever they're doing their work product you know work product and I would get all that information condense it into these reports and I would send them up the chain to generals there's there's probably probably about 20 generals and then there's that were usually always there, and then uh, there's a few other ones that uh, that, uh, that rotated sometimes. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of outside agencies as well, people with just civilian names, whatever. But anyway, uh, in my time there, I was working at the uh, the Air and Space Operations Center there when Benghazi happened, when the attacks happened in Benghazi, and uh, I was really concerned over what happened because one of the teams or one of the uh, subordinate units that reported to us was a rescue team out of Djibouti and uh, and then so uh, so whenever this all happened I, I uh, was at work and I ended up leaving thinking everything's gonna be okay at that point I saw drones overhead you could see just circling you know for hours while I was there left work I thought they were coordinating and uh, it turns out that they did nothing I mean not to mention the night prior, whenever before everybody was supposed to, you know, come in the next day, one of my good friends, Josh Salmon, he was working the night, night. Uh, it's called the watch desk. Basically, it's um, the there's a skeleton crew at night, at least at that time, and he was in operations intelligence. Him and one other person was in there, and then we had the CCO, commanding officer. Long story short, he told me that whenever the attacks started happening, he's watching this in real time, and he's starting to contact agencies to see what they can do to coordinate something, you know, surge assets is what it's called. And he goes out to the CCO at the time, and the CCO tells him, oh, uh, don't call anybody in, we can't do anything. That's what he told him. So that was really concerning for me, you know, and, and after I had seen at work uh, everything going on, and then I left, and then I came back, and nothing was done still, I, I was confused, you know, angry, and all kinds of things. And uh, turns out that, that there's a lot more going on than uh, we really understood. I mean, some of the things that came out, you already knew about, because you know, obviously we we're briefed on that every day. But um, so fast forward, I wait until I get out of the military, because at that point I realize if they're going to kill them they sure as heck will kill me. So it's easy decision to be quiet and, and then get out of the military. Did that and when I got out, I went over to, I lived, well I can't, I probably don't need to tell you where I live, um, but I went to someone on the Benghazi committee so that way I could go tell them because it's the safest place, right? I figured, and it was a Republican, you know, I thought it was the safest place. And, and, and you know, and I'm a, I'm a Republican, by the way, so, but, you know, I was surprised that whenever I went to them and said I have more information, I want to, you know, at least um, go on the record and, and provide my account of what happened. 
and they said we're not interested in that and, and that investigation is over so wow. uh, I you know I audibly sounded concerned in my voice after that when I was still talking with their chief of staff and then they said well uh, go ahead and call the FBI then and it's kind of like what are you gonna do about it and that was that that's where I was on yeah that's when I realized that everything was a lot more corrupt than I could have ever understood at that time. I knew something was wrong. So uh, I went to the FBI right after James Comey gets fired. I figured it might be safe by then. I thought it was just the top, top brass, you know. Wrong. Went to the FBI. Still haven't got a call back. And I'm not going to talk to you, by the way, ever. Yeah, you had your chance. Um, and uh, anyway, went to the FBI. They never called me back. All they had to do was look me up in the Office of Personnel Management to see where I worked and they would have known when I worked there. It would have been easy for them. Gave them all my information, they didn't do it. They didn't call me back. Okay, so anyway, fast forward, I kind of gave up on everything. Um, I waited for a while, I, you know, I didn't really have anything that I could do, so I saw Charles Woods in an interview with Dave Janda. By the way, he's great, Dave Janda. You gotta, you gotta check out his YouTube channel. And also, who's Charles Woods, for those who don't know? Charles Woods is the father of Ty Woods, who was killed on the rooftop in Benghazi by a mortar. And um, you know, I saw him in an interview with Dave Janda, and uh, in the interview he said that he's been lied to the entire time. He has no idea what happens to his son. He doesn't know why anything happened, and they've been lying to him the whole time. And um, so I didn't even think about it. I just picked up my phone and, and I sent an email right away to Dave. And luckily Dave was picking, he has tons of emails by the way. And so he, he luckily he saw it and he gave me a call, I just, it was really quick. And then I was just like, oh, okay. And then just kept rolling with it. So, and so thank you, Dave. And got connected with Charles. Yes, got me connected with Charles so I could tell him what happened. Amazing. So I get down there and talk with Charles and you know, it was a really hard conversation to have. It's a really hard conversation. And uh, from there, I, we, I got linked up with other witnesses, and then we've been going on radio shows and YouTube channels trying to get the truth out there. And uh, over time, you know, there's enough interest for us to do a presentation here at AmpFest, which is awesome. You got to come here. It's great weather, mm -hmm. great location, great people, great, great people. Oh boy, it's <laughs> lots of fun, lots of fun too. Um, so. What, uh, what was in my presentation, my presentation that's caught everybody's attention is that through that time where I've done these interviews and stuff, I've been connected with more witnesses, I came in contact with Alan Perot. Alan has a treasure trove of audio recordings, documents, going back years. I mean, we're talking a long time. He was in the Middle East for over 20 years. He, he, I don't want to say too much about it, but he's he's got recordings of a lot of people. So uh, something that everybody wants to have is the evidence. Ooh, I want to hear and see the evidence. Guess what? We have it. Mm -hmm. We have irrefutable evidence. We have audio recordings of people, government officials talking about it to Alan. Um, and in there, you're going to find out some pretty shocking things. And that's just the start of it. That's just um, a couple of audio recordings and a document, you're going to find out that three former CIA directors were all implicated by uh, allowing this to continue to keep bin Laden alive in Iran. Um, they moved him from Iran over to uh, Pakistan for the trophy kill. Instead of just giving him to us, they were Iran was like, all right, here, take him. They were going to give him to us. And instead, Hillary and uh, Biden and them cooked up this plan to have him transferred to Pakistan for a trophy kill. They wanted to do a trophy kill. Right before his re-election. Yeah, they wanted to do it right before his re-election. And then, so, yeah, you know, fast forward a little bit, he is re-elected. Mm. Um, one thing that people don't know, though, is that the payments to Iran were related to that. I've heard two things. I've heard that bin Laden, um, that wasn't him, is his body double. I mean, I guess we'll never know if they buried it at sea, that story, right? But uh, either way, even if they did kill him or didn't kill him, the payments occurred because of that transaction. And uh, of course, you know, the pallets of cash are kickbacks, right? So 
The transaction of seal team sixes. Oh, I'm talking about. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. So afterward, uh, after after the uh, this all happens, uh, seal team six gets shot down. It's only a really short time after that, and mm. that was highly suspect even to us. When, and when we were briefed on it and everything, it just none of it made any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knows where they are at any time. Practically a handful of people do. And uh, for them to be targeted so easily, like sitting ducks, you know that that was did not sit well. But anyway, I I've come to find out that uh, later that they were I knew that there were some weapons going through there. But I guess Hillary had been taken over the covert weapons program and pushed, started selling her weapons through there. There's only supposed to be small arms sold anyway, and they really didn't need them because we already provided the weapons, so they didn't even need to send the weapons through, straight up. Uh, so that didn't even need to happen anyway, that other covert program. So Hillary takes over Mark Turry's covert program and says, hey, I've got this now, me and my people are gonna do it. So first off, she didn't have authorization. Second off, State Department doesn't sell weapons. Third off, uh, the reason that she did was because she wanted to sell Stinger missiles through Benghazi to shoot down SEAL Team 6. They shot down SEAL Team 6 with a Stinger missile that was sold by Hillary Clinton out of a weapons cache from Qatar that the CIA had put there. Big problems here. So. Wow. Yes, and uh, so. Well, the people wanted, people are asking, when is everything gonna come out? What do oh. you say to that? Well, we're, we're right now, we have, we're giving all of the audio and the, uh, the documents to several different news outlets, mm -hmm. and whoever gets there first is first. Okay. So that's the way it's going to be, because not to fault anybody, but we've been delayed because we put our trust into just one, and we're just going to, there's not enough time, we're just yeah. going to give it to everybody. That's just the first stage, though. We're going to have a couple of documents. <laughs> Some audio that's irrefutable. It's so damning. Joe Biden screwed. Uh, and State Hillary, State Department screwed. I mean, everybody that's involved with this is, is just—they're going to hang for it. And my—I'm not an attorney or you know or anything like that, but it's pretty plain to see it's treason. So um, I'm going to look forward to seeing justice served for that crime because it's what it is. And uh, this is just a start. We have a lot more documents, a lot more audio of, of that I don't want to give away too much of. Mind blowing, we'll say that. All the other players involved uh, in the whole process, so. And yeah. can you confirm that a congressman, congressperson, has the documents? <laughs> yeah, we're not yeah. gonna say who. Yeah, I can't tell you who, but a congressman has everything. And, uh, Boy, am I glad that I was able to get that done. Yes. Yeah, Quickly so, as possible. Yeah, so there's nothing stopping it. It's there's nothing that can stop it right now. Yeah hey guys. It's going. It's gonna happen. In Jesus' name. Well Nick, we pray for you. Everyone pray for Nick. Pray for Alan. Pray for Charles Woods. Keep them in your prayers, guys. This is the most intense, groundbreaking information in American history, the biggest scandal, the biggest cover-up, treason, absolute treason. Benghazi is not going away, Hillary. It is not. So we pray for you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. You're a hero. God bless you. And by the way, where can everybody follow you? Oh, you can follow me on Twitter. I use the Twitter handle, science is my muse. It's, you know, all one word, science is my muse. Amen. Well, God bless thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.